On this week's episode, I'm joined by Cecilia Turiago, half Colombian, half Mexican, and a sustainable energy expert that's spending her time between Portugal and Mexico City. We discuss, amongst other things, Portuguese soup, safety, parts of the Portuguese culture that are not quite Latin, and of course, we talk about Portugal in the times of a European energy crisis, why Portugal is so far ahead in terms of sustainable energy, and how Portugal is still improving. For those of you listening, head over to our YouTube channel and watch this episode. And for those of you watching, click down below and subscribe. And now over to my conversation with Cecilia. Welcome back or welcome to another episode of Portugal, The Simple Life. And I'm delighted to be joined here by Cecilia Turiago. Did I say that correctly? You did. Not bad. Okay, Cecilia, how are you? Thank you for being on the podcast. Hello, Dylan. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm delighted to be here. Um, to be part of Portugal the same life. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. I mean, we're not too big on like um, nationalities and titles and things, but you are the first Mexican person that we've had on the podcast. So we can, uh, we can you know, they're record breaking, you know, so it's always good to have firsts. Well, there you go. And then you may have another first because I'm half Mexican, half Colombian. Okay, that is a first. Yeah, so that's a double okay. first. Cool. So, it's, so it's a double first. I'm half Mexican, half Colombian. I spend half of my time between Lisbon and Mexico City. I've lived in seven different countries, um, wow. speak four languages, or I should say I mix four languages. Um, I work in renewable energy, finance. I raise capital for utility scale, wind, solar and battery storage projects. I'm an impact investor focused on climate. I love entrepreneurship. This is one of my passions. Um, I'm involved in the Portuguese ecosystem, in the Mexican and in the Colombian entrepreneurial ecosystems. Amazing. Incredible. So how did you, I mean, how did you end up in Portugal? How did that, that, how did that all come about um, and spending so much time here? I, I came to Portugal into so in uh, the first time I was here was in 2017. I okay. I attended a wedding in Denmark and then I was I was supposed to meet a friend here, um, a Spanish friend that said, Oh, I used to work in Lisbon, so before, why don't we meet there? And I said, Oh, I've never been to Portugal. And I came and it was, I was I was delighted. I've never expected such a scenic, architectonically beautiful um, and especially this magical light um, that Lisbon has and the fact that it's such a manageable city that you can walk everywhere and the hills make it particularly enticing because then you can see these views um, and it's it's such a welcoming place. And then I went to Porto and completely fell in love with it. I love Porto and I love the fact that they are very open and they call me Menina. <laughs> that was just... It's that a compliment. Was fantastic. Um, and that is how the how I ended up here the first time. And I met Antonio Miguel, who ha, who heads um Maze Decoding Impact. He is uh, the leading, he is the leader of impact in Portugal because I'm part of this impact investment movement worldwide. And I met him at a conference in Chicago in 2017, and he said, Oh, you should look me up. Then I went back to Mexico. We had a major earthquake. Um, unfortunately, my my apartment was damaged. And I thought, okay, um, what shall I do? Shall I put everything into storage and and take a, a Portuguese course? And and how would that work in February? So I came. I came for six weeks. I didn't really know anyone aside from from Antonio and his team. And all of a sudden, I ended up myself with this amazing network from my graduate school in the in the US to a number of people, and and especially started meeting well Portuguese after the other, and and also in Mexico out of blue, I met this Portuguese that said, "Oh, you should be my friends in Lisbon." So and so, and and I and now I have a network that it's it's now. Five years after the fact, I I come and go, and here's my network. And at the time, I thought, okay, this is the perfect place to raise an, an impact fund. 
um, to get the startups from startups to scale ups, because what I can see is that they're trying to do the same things on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, mm -hmm. but they drown in the middle. They don't, okay. they cannot scale, they don't reach the scale needed to, to succeed, except from a, from a very few. And that is, in, in a nutshell, how I ended up here with, and how I spend time in between the two countries. Amazing. So, so how often are you back and forth? I mean, how often are you in Portugal? Um, yeah, I, is it kind of half half that you spend time between that the two it countries? It used to be half half. When the pandemia hit, I I used to rock climb and I had an accident in Fenda in Sesimbra. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. that was the end of my rock climbing career. Not that <laughs> I loved it, but not that I was a pro. Um, but I, I spent the pandemia in Mexico um, on crutches, unfortunately. Oh, sure. And now. Um, I spent more time in Mexico, um, not by design, um, but that is the way it goes now. And and here, um, I've been here twice this year. It used to be the other way around. I, I came okay. back um, back and forth every two months. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to move to Portugal for good. That would just be ideal. So I'm looking for the right opportunity. Oh, nice. Very nice. And I mean, Cecilia, so just take us back to kind of some of those first visits um, to Portugal. Um, you've you've mentioned a couple of things that sort of that you appreciated, but what were what I mean, you know, everybody comes with some expectations about the country. Um, now Portugal is, <clears throat> I mean, I'm a I'm a realtor, as you know, and my clients are from all over the world. And now Portugal is kind of like on the map. You know, everybody knows about Portugal. Everyone's looking at Portugal as an option. Um, but 2017, it was still relatively undiscovered. Um, what were your expectations and, and what surprised you about, about um, our country? Um, I had no expectations, in all honesty, because I, I've never been here. I've, I've been to Europe, but not, I, I lived in Italy for two years, lived in the okay. UK for four, um, been, I, since I was 18, I, I was back and forth Europe and, and Latin America and, and all over the world. But I had no expectations. I, at some point, a friend of mine, she, she's, her parents are Portuguese. She lives in the US. She, she mentioned that it was just beautiful. And, and I love tiles. I absolutely love tiles. You've come to the right place then. And I did. I came to the right place. But I, the light for me is there's something about the light that is just so unique. And I love photography. I'm passionate about visual arts, art, architecture and photography, as I mentioned. And this was very, this was very enticing. The other thing that, that really, that back in 2017, I mean, this Lisbon was not what it is. It was, and, and Porto wasn't either. They were both falling apart into pieces. Have I shown a mask? It, that was the, that was the actual that, that was the actual scene and for, and for years and years um, there were these the real lake buildings that you can you can see now in very few places but that that was that was the reality mm -hmm. and things have changed but I had absolutely no expectations um, as uh, as, a, as as a Latin um, what I probably wasn't um, ready for is that the Portuguese are very reserved. And it is, um, that was quite a surprise because they are very welcoming, but they're also very reserved. And, and as Latin, as mentioned, just living in Italy and, and, it's, and Spain and I'm being half Mexican, half, this is not something that you actually expect from, from a Latin country, but it has, it has, is I actually, at the end of the day, I love that once you have a Portuguese friend, you have a friend. Oh, and nice. yeah, it is. It's, it's just wonderful. I, I, I am very, very blessed and, and grateful for having them. And I can see that where that reserve part of the, of the character comes from. Yeah, I mean, what do you think that's about? Because that's quite, it's, it's something that's quite perplexing for a lot of uh, nationalities, because I think your know, people do expect to come and kind of find, the, find these very loud, elaborate uh, people, um, like you said, in some of the more Latin cultures. 
but they're not like that. They're quite discreet. Uh, they're a bit standoffish a little bit uh, when they initially, and, and a lot of that's got to do with them just wanting to respect your privacy and and your and and, your, and, and all of that. But what do you think is the um, the reason why they why why that there's that little difference in the culture there? It is. It has to do with, with the way the cultural wise, and it's the Iberian Peninsula. And you can see architecture, how how things are built, and the way they're built is pretty much indoors. Life mm-hmm. happens indoors. It doesn't happen outdoors. The weather he actually it you could have a life outdoors because it's mm-hmm. such a, it's such a mild weather at the end of the day. But the reality is that this this comes from centuries, and life happens behind closed doors. And this is this is the difference. For example, um, Spain has that mix where life do, does happen behind closed doors, but at the end of the day, it is much more of a outward looking. While in while in Portugal and and also the way the peninsula is, you you have eight different regions in a very long country. So my sense is that. They are explorers, adventurers, adventurers, but at the same time, that is where life takes place indoors mm. and it doesn't really. And once, and indoors, I also mean it in, in a figurative way where it's once you, once you open up, you do, but before you actually get there, um, you need to let someone in. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. It's an interesting perspective. Um, how many languages do you speak? I I mix four. I I I speak mix. How many languages do you mix? Um, well, especially my mother tongue, the English, Italian, and and Portuguese. I I learn French, but that is very rusty, and and Portuguese. But okay. and and the ones that I mixed <laughs> terribly are Italian and Portuguese. Okay, so so you fit in well from that perspective. Portuguese love the, love their languages. Uh, it's not co- it's not uncommon to find a, a Portuguese person that speaks three or four languages as well. So that's that's interesting. Um, you mentioned that you're going to be um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. You mentioned you're going to be looking for a, um, a, a potentially a home here. Um, have you settled yeah. on a location? Have you have you visited a, any other places where you thought, okay, yeah. this could also be interesting? Uh, where else have you explored? I've been to the Azores Islands, and that is just okay. my mind blowing. I love São Miguel. I, I I absolutely adore it. Yeah. Um, I've been I've been to the north. Um, I've been to uh, to I mean I've, I've been to Braga, Rosende, Porto, um, Aveiro, then all the way down Coimbra, and then Évora, and. Um, okay. Well, Lisbon and all the way down Faro, Lagos, and, and, and the Algarve. But um, the islands were just mind blowing. It's they're beautiful, they're pristine. People are very, uh, also very welcoming. I love them. Um, clean, spotless, clean, and and just so green. It's they they are magical. Um, in terms of what. I, uh, well, I would choose to leave for good. It's Lisbon, and the re- the the reason is definitely weather is um, weather makes a difference in life. The fact sure. that, I, and also because I come from such a massive, chaotic, loud city, that feeling safe and walking everywhere is just such a blessing, and yeah. it is. Bonus, I cannot tell you how relieved every time I arrived here is like who my I am completely relieved is it's yeah. just it's, it's so different and it is such a livable city. I can go sailing in no time. I can just go down to the desert and and I I can be at the sea by the seaside in less than a half an hour train or go to Sintra and then this this beautiful magical um plays where you can do like from hiking to well former rock climbing or just these this architecture that they say like the, there are so many palaces if, if you want to see something different and yeah. also culture wise because the arts drive my life and the Gobenkian um, foundation has this amazing collection and also is 
very prominent in terms of promoting culture and art. And so is Cezere. Um, I'm a contemporary dance lover, so it's this is where this is where I like to be. Amazing. Um we'll get on to the we'll get on to the the business side of things. Um but obviously there's there's been these other things that that um have drawn you to 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 want to have a home here. Um you mentioned the weather and 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 things like that. Um but just doubling back on that safety thing, um, because this again, again, with clients all over the world, this is always a question. Um, I'm originally from Johannesburg in South mm-hmm. Africa. Yeah, well, so we've got we've got something yeah. in common coming oh. from a crazy city uh, yeah. and not being able to walk to things and, and not being able to live. And then you get here and it's like heaven, you know, um, for, for, a, you know, for you going out and, and walking on your own and stuff at night. I mean, how important of that was a factor for your for your decision um, to, to want to spend more time here? How, how, how huge is that uh, for you for, with your with your background? Hey, it is um, that out of the seven, the seven countries I've lived in, this is the first one I choose. And the fact that this is a safe city, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong about the weather. I'm from Mexico City and we have uh, we have temperate weather, but the light, as I mentioned, is very important to me. And the fact that I don't have to carry an umbrella every day is, is also relevant and I don't freeze to death or 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 boiling hot. Oh, I, I cannot melt. Take it. Yeah. Um, but in terms of safety, is this has become uh, this is one, of course, for me that it, it really, really counts. The fact that I can let my it's not that I can let my guard down, but it is it's such a different feeling that I don't have to watch over my shoulder every single moment and don't really know what to expect. Um, yeah. And this is something that's invaluable, especially to someone that comes from such um, from a country that is in such disarray. Um, at the moment yeah. and yeah. that we we always have to watch out um yeah yeah it's a relief it's isn't it it's, it's just like yeah. a, a complete weight lifted off your shoulders and a stress that you don't have to worry about anymore yes i i it is it's a relief that's why i meant when every, every time i come back it's just like whew, okay yeah really incredible. incredible um have you been to the Silver Coast? Have you been to to north of of Lisbon, Nazaré area, San Martinho de Porto? No, I haven't. Okay, no, you I shouldn't. Haven't. You shouldn't. Don't come this side because if you do, you might question whether or not you want to live in Lisbon. Just saying. I'm just saying. It's amazing. Yeah, I it's amazing. I think um, I'm dying to go to Comporta Melide. Um, it's um the, there's something that is 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 quite challenging because. Mexico never ratified the the mobile uh, the, the mobility the international mobility treaty, so we cannot have our licenses exchange. And every time I try that, they, it's still the point in time that I need to get my appointment for my practical test. And unfortunately, that limits. Oh, you have I can't to do- rent a car, so I have to take the course from scratch, as if I've never driven in my whole life. I have to take the course. From scratch, um, the theoretical one, then pass that one and wait for who knows how long the Portuguese authorities call me so I can take my test. And then you have to do the practical one as well. You actually have to. That, that's yeah. the one. That's the one. Uh, oh, you've that, done the theoretical one already? Yeah, no, well, I haven't, but that, okay. that's not an issue. The fact that I, I, I tried to exchange my license and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, but we need to call you for the practica. I'm like, when? And they're like, oh, in about six months. I'm like, can I have my driver's license back? <laughs> so that is, unfortunately, that prevents me from just driving a number of places where I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, uh, do you drive on the same side of the road in Mexico as here? Yeah, yeah. Is it do. also, okay, so that's at least not too, too strange. Yeah, um, yeah, but I've driven since I was 15, and, and it's just insane that I, I you have to do that. Not, all again. Here is a matter of them calling me to take my test. Yes. Yeah. That's a, there's a bit of a, a, a blind spot there. You know, they need to uh, make that a little bit quicker, but yeah. Um, in terms of the, the, I mean, the startup scene has become quite well documented. Lisbon's got this amazing startup and networking scene. I mean, um, 
one of the things that I've really appreciated about, about Portugal doing business here and then also with the podcast is how accessible everybody is. Yes. The networking is, is a, wonderful here because you literally can pick up a call and you're not going to get passed around by secretaries and you normally can get directly to the person that you want to reach and they say yes or no, whatever the case is. <clears throat> you mentioned how you've grown your network. How has that been as a businesswoman? How has that been for you, the networking and, and the accessibility to people in this country? It's um at the end of the day, it's it's a mix between the expert world, the, the investor, I mean sure. angel investor, investors, uh, funds, uh, lawyers, um, and a suite of people, um, and especially women, uh, female, female investors which is this amazing network and, and very, very prominent women in this country, both Portuguese and, and foreigners that, that live here. That, that has been, that it just is, is worn, it, it has grown organically. One, one person introduces you to another and you, you have these things in common and pretty much that is how the whole thing, the whole thing started or, or it gets, for me, it it has been organic. Um, I cannot I I cannot tell you how I got like I got referred to my lawyers and they have their star innovation practice and then they sponsored these and then they invited me to these pitches and then I got to Castle de Pacto and so it's been just one um, a very organic growth, not something mm -hmm. that you um you have to push for it. It's just um it just happens. It just happens yeah um we've had we've had um a number of business people on and and some female entrepreneurs and it's something that that people have said still needs to get better but it is quite good how many women are doing amazing things in in portugal um was that something else that you also appreciated yeah, uh, indeed. Um, there's there are a couple, there are a couple of women, Portuguese women in tech, women in tech um, that are very active in the in the startup world. But the reality is that Portugal is still pretty much a male dominated country, and this was a total scandal. But you could see the Espresso, the Jornal de Notícias. Yeah, last yeah, yeah. Year. I remember. That was I remember, I remember. Such a scandal. I can't not believe that out of those 12 people, they couldn't portray one single woman. It was just scandalous, especially yeah. like given the amount of ministers they have um, in the cabinet and given the amount of scientists and of female, female leaders in this country, it was just scandalous, preposterous. Yeah. And the reality is that still when you walk into a room, it's pretty much the case. Um, and I think that slowly but surely that's changing and they are aware, especially now for, for these, and these entrepreneurs, um, that diversity matters because at the end of the day, it's a reflection of your customers. And so if you don't understand your customer base, especially 52%, 50 or 64, pending exactly. because the, um, the female, the shopper doesn't necessarily is, is not the final customer but at the end of the day the shopper has makes the decision and women are 60 percent of the of the shoppers and they're they, we make 50 percent or 52 percent of the population and we also have something that's called purchasing power so the more the more you think about these of the, or society as a whole and that if you leave that half of the population um behind well surprise surprise then that's not yeah. the reflection of your customer base and or and yeah. and you're going to and your your business is going to suffer as a result yeah. Yeah. and the more you bring more cultures and and also in terms of cultures age disability um gender everything that we need at the table because that is society the more you enrich that within your own company the better you're going to serve yeah. your customers yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, also talking about that mix, because this is something that's also come up a lot on the podcast. It's something that I get asked a lot by clients. Um, and you've alluded to that now when you're speaking about your network was this mixture of Portuguese and expats. Um, and there does seem to be this, this climate where everyone kind of finds a way to work together um, and a nice, a, a nice mixture. We see this when people just come to visit our country, how welcoming it is and how, how people welcome. 
but you but maybe you can shine some light on it from a business perspective um there just seems to that seems to carry across in the business world as well where there's this the networking and the mixture of different cultures and 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 nationalities quite effortlessly in, in not only in Lisbon but but all over the country um has that been your experience as well um it has up to an extent because mm -hmm. it, it depends which obviously which sector you you talk about sure. uh, those that are much more open especially entrepreneurship and tech and everything that has to do with with cyber crypto zones, but, but the energy industry is, is still pretty much dominated by a couple of players. Um, okay. They're bringing they're bringing more people um, from abroad, but um, it, in that regard, I I must say that it's still it's still driven by certain companies and and those companies operate in a certain way. I mm -hmm. think that it has to do more with the sector that when when you when you realize that it is it's it's a very, and also in terms of the red tape here, it's not always evident um, how to do business in Portugal or how to go around it. And this is something that hinders the economy in, in terms of taxation. This is nothing new. This is been voiced yeah. time again. Um, it, is, it is at 48% and, and salaries here are are very low in comparison with the rest of the European Union. It has to do with productivity, obviously, um, but it is it is a brain drain. It what it represents um, um, for the country is a brain drain. Is, uh, is a brain drain where young generations, um, if you don't have the right last names here, they they encounter all these obstacles and they have an amazing education and and they prefer to go abroad. Which, which I find that this is something that the country needs to tend to um, because what's, what's bringing um, more talent into Portugal um, is also you have an inflow of, of foreigners um, building businesses and tapping on this talent that's here, but you also have a very dissolution uh young population that doesn't find the right opportunities so mm. it is something that needs to be tackled yeah yeah there needs to be a mixture and a, and a balance somewhere along the line um talking about energy um this is your your field of expertise this is how we got in touch um originally on linkedin um it is a question that is probably one of the top three questions that every single one of our clients asks when they talk about Portugal, um, the energy efficiency of the houses, how much does the energy cost? We have a crisis in Europe at the moment for how much people are paying just to heat their homes, um, just to stay warm at night. Um, where, I mean, Portugal's made huge leaps and bounds over the last 10 years in this area, in this field. Uh, you mentioned that there's still, you know, some, dominating players and all that kind of thing but maybe you can just chat about the the, the, the parts of of um you know energy efficiency sustainable energy in portugal where they where they're getting it right where they are ahead of the curve um and and doing a fantastic job so i mean just the floor is yours tell us a little bit about what you've learned uh, in this in this area um, Portugal generates its electricity uh, six percent of its electricity from renewable sources um, hydro being the main renewable source, followed by... Sorry, what, what percentage, wind. Cecilia? 60%. Six, 60. zero. Okay. Six, zero. Okay, 60 okay. percent uh, of renewable energy. In, in terms of the energy ma matrix, Portugal produces its energy out of renewable sources. And 6% comes from hydro mainly, then followed by wind and, and solar. Solar is still a very minor part of this mix. Um, there mm. is there's also biomass in that in that mix um, and geothermal. In in term, Portugal phased out coal in 2021, which is this this is very this uh, we we welcome those news in terms of fossil fuels, but it still depends on important natural gas to generate ba what it's called base load electricity, and it is it the 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 market, the electricity market, is is connected with the it's connected with the um, Spanish market. So it's called the Iberian market. The electricity. Okay. This is in terms of generation. Um, 
I'm not an expert by any means in terms of uh, in, of energy efficiency. There are two sides of the of the of the coin. One is is how you generate it, how you transmit the the energy, and and how you distribute it. And a very different one, how you actually once you are indoors, how you save this energy. But what I can see from in terms of energy efficiency is that because of the way again we, we go back to how things are built in the country and you're looking at at the end of the day this is pretty much um, bricks concrete and iron so on and so forth and insulation wasn't part of of, of that mix until very recent and mm-hmm. and the and the fact that it's a small it is it is a small country and it's still um the way it's it's interconnected it makes um, the prices are still um, for the consumer. They're still very high. This is getting resolved um, in terms of distributed generation, which is the solar panels that you see on top of, of on rooftops, and and this is where Portugal is making inroads. And you can you can solve a number of energy poverty, uh, tackle energy poverty with uh, with distributed generation and with heating pumps i think that in the new buildings are are definitely and now that you have you can see from a to f where you are in that energy efficiency and how you heat up in there is solar thermal for heating up water and there is solar for like solar pv for electricity generation um there are some buildings in Lisbon that that are prone or probably that you can actually install install that. Whether it makes sense, economic sense remains to be seen. If yeah. if you can get your if you if the energy you get already um, from the grid is renewable, does it make sense to to go into the expense? It probably does for mm-hmm. for buildings and warehouse like very large surfaces. That is where you can see um, that, and even for for one um, one one family homes, um, then it makes sense uh, yeah. to have your own your yeah, especially own in a, especially in, in these old buildings where, like you mentioned, insulation wasn't really part of the plan. Um, these are these cost a lot of money to to heat or to regulate temperature. So maybe in that situation, it's worth it. But obviously, in your new construction, insulation is part of the the way that they built um, and has got has got a little bit better has got much better actually uh, in, in that mm-hmm. regard. Yeah. Indeed. So, w- um, what can you tell us about the sustainable energy in 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 Portugal? I mean, that's your your um, your area. Well, Portugal is at the forefront because it's uh, the fact that it generates its energy uh, that six percent is already there, and the, and back in two thousand seventeen, there was uh, there were there were a couple of days um, within a week uh, during I can't recall it was September that Portugal generated its all of its electricity from renewable sources, so it can be done, and especially now with battery storage, Portugal is betting heavily on green hydrogen on producing green hydrogen because it has the ability to do so. Solar, um, they're working now on floating solar on reservoirs. Um, EDP has a couple of projects and they, and there is something that is going that is this is going to be a, ma- a massive shift in terms of, of what Portugal can do um, with offshore wind, floating offshore wind. This, yeah. this, this is going this is a game changer for Portugal because the Iberian market is not interconnected with the rest of the European market. So they're, they're, that's it. Your, your energy stops at the, at the, at the, at the Spanish yeah. border. It doesn't go into France. But with the ability... Yeah. Okay, sorry, just to come to that quickly. I, 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 sorry to cut you off. Um, now, I, I had a guy on the podcast who spoke about that. The, apparently, that's got something to do with the connection point between Iberia, the and and France and that's why it can't be exported correct yes and it has it has a lot to do with the markets it has it, it is physical but it's also in terms of markets but it okay. is physical so that the European Union has been working on this for a long time there is there is a, a transmission line now being built between the Anabuxtel and and the Spanish and, and the Spanish border um, okay. on the not on the northern side of the of the country and the importance of that is because 
the end of the Castello, it's the first floating wind project is is out of Piano de Castello. I, I believe it's, it's 20 me 25 megawatts. It's not a very large project in terms of, in terms of for, for utility, but what it means is that now Portugal and Morocco are looking into, um, into green hydrogen because probably it makes much more sense to, to produce uh, energy in Morocco and then produce the green hydrogen on this side. Um, of the of the strait and so, but the game changer for portugal is offshore wind because those those are very very large projects and this is something that you can actually export your electricity you can actually export it to germany or to the netherlands or to other to those places that need it because this is going to go through the seaside um instead mm -hmm. of trying to get through the alps or the pyrenees or, or, the, or the the whole mountain reach um on um in inland and this is a game changer so for me there are a couple of things that are, are very um, are very um relevant in terms of where portugal is is going and one is this effort and this bet on green hydrogen on offshore wind they are they're working heavily on the technology the, um, it's called um there they have a couple of companies principal power and um, edpr is an investor in them and principal power is is in, is involved in the technology for floating wind. This is one of the global players. So these are game changers for Portugal, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and the fact that you're, they're looking at so uh, ag agrovoltaics, where you have and you have all these land in the Algarve, and then you have all uh, all these land all over the, all over the country where you can actually install um, solar panels and still uh, and still have agricultural activities on the need um so this is something that god is exploring yeah well we've got enough ocean uh for for the 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 floating wind and then yeah i mean it, it's 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 funny because we had um some dutch some dutch celebrities the other day on the podcast and they were talking about how densely populated the netherlands are um in comparison to to portugal uh, it's a small country geographically, but it's a country where there's a lot of space um, to do these kind of these kind of things. Um, so we've definitely got the space for for more solar panels and and that kind of thing. Yes, um, and at the end of the day, it's if the solar panels are, are very helpful in terms of distributed generation. Um, but the reality is that you still need to the interconnection and the demand because the, there are only ten million here. But there is such a demand in 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 the rest of in the rest of Europe that when you you stop thinking that you can become a net exporter of the energy, then, yeah. then this is the game changer. Yeah, it's huge. Well, I mean, we've got a lot of listeners from Northern Europe, so Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium. A lot of questions that we're getting asked is is for people saying, is it not worth me to put my make my primary residence in Portugal for the cold months? And then go back home to my home country uh, for the warmer months because this is going to cost me a lot less money uh, in Portugal. And you know the weather's our winters are not bad, so that helps. Um, but then our energy costs are not are not as expensive. I mean, I know you deal on a larger scale, but for people that are looking just to cut costs and to you know, not break the bank every time they want to heat their homes. Um, Portugal starts to present a really, really interesting option um, for them. It does. Um, I think it boils down to what, what kind of property you have and if you can install your own panels and if you can insulate your place and if you can have solar thermal and heating pumps and so on. The, of course, the, the, that is the perfect the perfect mix for for a modern um, or state of the art um, sustainable home, um, yeah. whether, whether that's uh, that's feasible. Um, yeah. an, that's an old that. stone an, an old stone house is not maybe going to do the trick. Indeed, even though they're very very charming, it might not do. It might not might not be the right option. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. So you, uh, I hope you're looking for a modern house, Cecilia. Not, um, not an absolutely. Stone. Yeah, for, for me, there are two things. I cannot deal with. I I, I cannot deal with the heat. Uh, I'm used to these. I'm used to fr like freezing inside. This is my every day in Mexico because it's so high above sea level, and we have mountains everywhere, and they get snowed. And 
we have window like two like 230 250 280 or three meter windows like 20 meter long and we freeze to death and that's a real like for me for, the freezing indoors is just part of, of my this is welcome home but i cannot deal with the heat um and so the, this is just so relevant to me that if i am going to look for place it has to be a place where you feel comfortable and don't have to wear pullovers and hats and, and jumpers and things um, during the inside, winter. Which inside my, the house. Which is my case. Uh, I'm done with that. And and I, I simply cannot deal with, with warm weather. It's just like I can't deal with that. Yes, yeah. Cecilia, where can that where can we improve in Portugal in terms of sustainable? I mean, you 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 oh, before we started interviewing, you said there's some things that need to be improved upon they they're trying to um just give us a, a short sort of uh, insight into into that where we where we can get better there are a couple of things that i i really admire about the and this is these are some of my favorite um impact entrepreneurs and everything that they are trying to do in terms of, of ocean plastics and uh, this yeah. is also some way a place that that there is room for improvement there in terms of ocean plastics because um although it is very minor in terms of what what is considered ocean plastics um the fishing gear portugal is one of one they have one of the largest fishing fleets um both portugal and canada yeah. and at the end of the day this fishing gear ends up um and not necessarily but the, by it's it's more by by design than than actually that they leave them behind because they're they're very expensive to be left behind but they break and then at the end mm. of the day this is this is something that that Portugal and its fleets have to consider and I'm not talking about like the small fishermen no I'm talking about the very large the big ones um, yes the very large companies. And the fact that Portugal is is working on recycling and making all and, and nanotechnologies in in terms of what they do with the, with ocean plastics, because you mentioned the coast, and this is very relevant because yeah. it, it gets washed. Um, most of this is coming, it's going all over the world, and it gets a wash on on the on the Portuguese coast. And the Nord is working on nanotechnologies to transform all of this plastic into, into textiles, into different materials, um, between material science. And I've seen amazing things coming out of ocean plastics in, in Portugal. So this is um, fishing nets and a number of things, um, microplastics also being tackled, a number of things. And the others are, are, are in terms of in terms of climate, um, again, they, they are at the forefront of renewable technologies, um, floating, as I mentioned, for example. And in terms of sustainability, there is a lot now that the country is doing, and also this young generation that is much more aware of how, what is it that waste means. And waste at the end of the day is a source, is if you look at circular economy model, business models, at the end of the day, source is just such a magnificent resource. Waste, sorry, is such a magnificent resource um, that you can actually reuse it, recycle, refurbish, yeah. number of things that you can do with it. But I stop looking at it as waste and start looking at it as a resource. And people here are getting much more aware of, of the value of this, this waste and not just dump it. Um, which which you can read everywhere is don't dump your 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 rubbish on the floor. Um, there is value to it. The one that it's um, that it's also something that um, you can see in, in terms of electric vehicles and in terms of where this is going mm. and how you generate that electricity and what it's it's bringing to the country. There are smart grid technologies and other things that. Portugal is, start, is starting to look at, into, especially because now you have all these um, electric vehicle uh, fleets, but you're still dealing with lithium. Um, that could be a source of income for Portugal, but lithium at the end of the day, it the certifies um, the, whichever soil is in it, it has 
an impact. And, and yeah. probably that's the reason that they're still wondering whether they will approve or not these very massive um, uh, my lithium mining um, opportunities that they have. Yeah. Um, but they there are other there are other smart grids and there there are things that you can do with those batteries and and, mm -hmm. and urban mining as I mentioned urban mining you get we have so much electronic rubbish but there is there is there is so much lithium and cobalt in everything that goes what goes to waste and Portugal is is making inroads so we're on the right track yeah, it is indeed yeah yeah. Let's talk about Portugal, not from an energy point of view, just from Cecilia's point of view a little bit more. Um, what do you, what do you think Portuguese people? Just you know, the people that you come into contact with in the street when you're walking around Lapa or walking to uh, first away, which is your favorite lookout point? This is always a difficult question. Which is your favorite lookout point in the uh, city? Ah, we'll go to the Sao Pedro de Alcantara. Okay, that's, that's easy. Um, there are two. That's Mirador de Sao Pedro da Cantra. That's one, and the other one is a, is one that very few people know in pra, in Praceres. Okay, yeah, that, uh, I know that as is. Well. Um, and I just love to be when you the the Mat Bridge that li pretty much leads to nowhere because it yeah. just goes from the Mat to and um, to the Lem. And when you're standing there, this ha you can actually see the river and the and cry and the and Christ to. to um, uh, uh, and the bridge and that is also very nice but in terms of of, of Miradores is um, Miradores and Pedro de Cantara and this particular one in Praceres that no one knows Great, we won't tell anybody about it we'll edit it out of this interview so that no one uh, no one knows and about it but I'm sure some do great place for a sunset that one in Praceres because of the because of that angle Indeed. that you get with the with the river and the and the ocean and everything um Let's talk a little bit about food, Cecilia. You come from a culture where your your flavors are amazingly rich and everything. What about the Portuguese food? What can you tell us? I love seafood, um, but um, I must confess that when I'm here, I'm mostly vegan or a vegetarian. Okay. Um, every time I come, um, it's um, because... I would love to make this amazing fish. Um, there is such a variety, but you need a good over. You need a number of things that I don't always have access to, and it's it's nicer when you when you share these these seafood with friends. Um, mm. But on an everyday, I actually love Portuguese soups. They are so soup? thick. I love yes, I love Portuguese soups. They are very thick. I have a number of places that I go on a daily basis that. That serve these amazing soups, um, vegan, vegetarian. You know, I, I just, but they're very thick, and I love thick soups. Yeah, some of the soups that we have here are almost more like stews, mm -hmm. um, and they really fill up the stomach. But it's if like if there's a definition of comfort soup, uh, Portugal yeah, comfort soup, <laughs> caldevet without the without the chorizo. If you're going vegan, yes, you know? indeed. But why you gotta have the you gotta have the chorizo? It's like it makes the flavor and everything. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. Talk about it. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not against, but I'm allergic to pork. So <laughs> there you go. Oh no, that's un that's unfortunate. Now that's yeah. really unfortunate. Um, what do you think Portuguese people should be proud of? About God, their, I think that they have country? so many things to be proud of. Um, what what they're not to be proud of? I think that the fact that they're welcoming, the fact that they're adventurous, that they're curious, and also that. Um, it's this leave and let leave mentality, at least with foreigners. Um, it's it's very important. Um, I mean, every single culture has its things that um, I'm no one to comment in terms of, of, of like what Portuguese should do in terms of their own culture. But I think that they, they are so many things that they should be proud of. And it's this curiosity, this adventure mentality, and these these welcoming temper because at the end of the day i've never feel unwelcome here um they've always been very and as i mentioned i love the nord because i the, the day i got there i'm like oh i'm in Nina. i'm like was because here in in lisbon everything is so proper and so um and it's also yeah, they're, a bit more, they're a bit more blunt they're a little bit more blunt in the north 
um, yeah, more the the I think direct. The, 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 yeah, which I like. I actually I like. But yeah. Also, the way they express is 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 much more akin to to where I come from, which is senorita. And the way that the, the second someone calls you senorita, you're already floating. And so it's like menina and and these very one things. Is yeah. they're a happy bunch in the north. Um, so <clears throat> they have yeah, so like uh, for for people right. listening, um, and when when. Menina the, literally is, means a, a girl, um, but in a certain context, it could be kind of like young lady. It is, uh, it's young lady. and that's yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it is well in the context when someone calls you um, at a restaurant or, or see a menina, that would be um, young lady. And so for anyone yeah. past a certain age, <clears> who's <throat> like, oh my god, absolutely, it's like please call me Menina. Yeah, so, and there's almost uh, like a motherly. <clears throat> there's almost like a motherly tone in it when especially when it's an old lady that's serving you at a restaurant or wanting yeah, to know what you want to eat I, I find that very sweet um, yeah it's it's adorable yeah they do that with with us sometimes menino but i haven't been called that for for a long long time so, <laughs> uh, that's unfortunate that shows my age but uh but yeah um when people when people ask you why Portugal, why are you thinking of going to live there uh, at uh, when you're back home, what are you what are you telling them? The quality of life is is amazing here. Just just the fact, I mean, the few things I've mentioned, the fact that I can walk everywhere, that it's a manageable city, that it has a magnificent like has everything in terms of art, mm. um, these magnificent collections. Um, it has, I mean, it has. Uh, worldwide you you can have the AP, like a worldwide artists coming and um, to perform at the Gulbenkian that is that is very important to me and also the fact that you can go sailing in the afternoon go cycling uh, or or rock climbing I don't any longer unfortunately but and 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 practice yoga in, in the park a number of things that are just that is what makes life um, and it makes life easy it's 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 a simple life um as instead of these very complicated massive like getting to point a for point b which is a challenge where i come from mm. it is yeah. uh, it's just a very different um yeah it is a very different scene yeah cecilia what is what is one thing that you want people to remember and take away from our conversation just that um that there is an amazing, um, not a, there is not only an amazing an entrepreneurship spirit here, or entrepreneurial, I should say, an entrepreneurial spirit in every regard, but that this country has everything to actually reach that potential. And I, I honestly hope that at some point um, the, the productivity reaches a level that entices um, better salaries and you can actually keep that population here that very mm. very educated young and population with a number of aspirations and we can actually as foreigners bring raise that raise that for everyone so the quality of life not only for the ones that come and have certain means but that we can actually raise the quality of life for everyone in here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how can people follow you online? Um, keep up to date with your work. LinkedIn. LinkedIn? LinkedIn. Yes, LinkedIn. Okay. So we'll, we'll put a, a, um, a link in the show notes uh, so that people can get in touch if they'd like to chat to you or, or follow and keep up to date with what you, the work that you're doing. Um, Cecilia, I've loved this conversation. Um, a question that we ask all of our guests, Portugal, the simple life, why? It is, it's, it's just a manageable way of life. It is from walking to, to enjoying your meal to, to actually enjoying a sunset, having this amazing light um, shed on you. It's, it's a simple life. Wonderful. Beautifully said. Um, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. That's and I'm going to let you call it. Exactly. That's a wrap. 
notes. Thank you once again to Cecilia. And thank you to all of you for listening. Please subscribe, share with your friends, give us a thumbs up, and please leave a comment or a review. We'd love to hear from you. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. And as we say in Portugal, Forza. Forza.